active research in the southeastern uh, fishing communities of Georgia, South Carolina since 2000, and South Carolina since 2013, as well as the U.S. Virgin Isle, Virgin Islands of St. Croix and St. Thomas since 2015. Her research focuses on seafood production and fishing communities, relating mariculture to health and well-being, and the cultural heritage of these populations. Uh, Dr. Tooks is the Vice Chair of the Socioeconomic Panel of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council and serves on the SSC for the Council as well. She's an active and she's been active in the Society of Applied Anthropology. Her research has taken a variety of forms, including a project to investigate the feasibility of a lion fish fishery in the U.S. Virgin Islands, a pilot project on the health and well-being of commercial fishing crew and seafood processing uh, employees in Georgia and South Carolina, a project on aquaculture oysters in Georgia, and several uh, Georgia-focused projects exploring cultural, cultural heritage, resilience, and sustainability of Georgia's commercial fisheries. Most recently, she was the PI for a Georgia Sea Grant-funded social census of Georgia's working waterfront, and that's what we're going to be hearing about today. And I see Jennifer has a question. So I will go into the um, presentation, if you just give me one second. All right, it should be starting. Hello, my name is Jennifer Sweeney Tooks. I'm an applied anthropologist at Georgia Southern University, and I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about our research project, a social census of Georgia's working waterfronts. This project was funded by Georgia Sea Grant and UGA Marine Extension as part of their 2018 to 2020 funding cycle. And it was a 35 month long project with lots of data and lots of moving parts. Uh, so I'd like to start off by thanking the funders and thanking all of you for listening to this, uh, what is actually a brief snapshot of uh, the entirety of this project. And so when we first proposed this project, current data on Georgia seafood industry demographics and economics and social conditions was really missing. And so we sought to fill that gap through investigating uh, really a twofold set of problems. And I'm gonna talk about those in just a minute. Before I go on though, I would very much like to introduce the research team. This was very much a team and collaborative effort. Uh, one of these faces, several of these faces might be familiar to all of you. Uh, we worked with Tracy Yandel, who was an associate professor at Emory University at the time, uh, also on the SEP and the SSC, and research in fisheries policy. Of course, we have lost Tracy to New Zealand at this point. Um, I also want to point out Gina Shamshak, who is a fisheries economist. Gina's really brilliant at bridging social issues and social science concerns with also the social science of economics and economic possibilities and quantitative analysis possibilities for that sort of data. And lastly, uh, the person who really supported all of our outreach and extension efforts is Brian Flick, who many of you know. Brian Flick is the Associate Marine Extension Director at the Brunswick Station for UGA Marine Extension or Merix and Georgia Sea Grant. So as I mentioned, we were really looking to fill a, a lot of data gaps that we found in our research that's been ongoing in Georgia's fishing communities since about 2013. So our two guiding questions for this entire project were, number one, what are the demographic and economic and social well-being patterns for businesses and workforce and community in Georgia's coastal seafood industry? And how do those patterns change over time? And then secondly, now let's, let's sort of take that and, and go one step further, where do we go from here? What strategies can improve the long-term sustainability of Georgia's seafood industry workforce? So we set out to answer those two questions through a multitude of different data gathering methods. And you can see that in these two charts above. We were really combining data methods to provide a comprehensive approach to gathering as much diverse data as we could. And in each of those research questions, we were using multiple methods. We were systematically developing triangulation among our data sources, looking to see where we were getting overlap in different means of asking the questions to make sure that the answers we were finding were as accurate as could be. Um, so I will 
leave, leave, leave this slide, but want to mention right off the bat that everything that I talk about here and most of the images that you see here today are also available in our comprehensive project report, um, which I can share with Council and is also available on our website, which is workingwaterfronts.org. So if I'm going too quickly through any of these slides, please do feel free to look at that full report so that you can take a look at those numbers or those charts for a little bit longer. So to fully address those questions, of course, is this really huge task? And we're looking at these multiple research topics. And so you can see in this image here, we're, we're trying to get our, our minds around how do we tackle all of these different things, of course, with the fishing industry at the core of all of these questions. So with demographic data, we were looking at just traditional demographic measures, looking at how these have changed over time and then how the characteristics within the fishing industry, the commercial seafood industry, compared to broader uh, demographic trends in the county or in the state. Economically speaking, we were trying to characterize industry assets, boats, infrastructure, docks, railways, looking at costs of operation, um, also looking at how household income and how much of that was derived from commercial fishing, but looking then also at historic and current distributions of landings and external impacts on profitability. So here we're talking about regulatory impacts, imports, extreme weather events, those sorts of things. Uh, myself in particular was very interested in health and well-being. We were interested in the mental and physical health characteristics of the seafood industry, including here broad traditional health measures, uh, including things like access to health insurance, but also addiction, in, addiction in issues and trust in industry participants and some of the management regulatory bodies. We were interested in geographic distributions of the industry. We wanted to document the current and historic geographic patterns of infrastructure locations, of landings, and of economic activities. All of this, of course, then plays into the industry sustainability. What are the current and the long-term challenges to the seafood industry's sustainability, including things like uh, the characteristics of the workforce, who were the current employees and captains and crew, what is the industry or what are industry participants thinking about strategies for future workforce development? And then in all of this, look at the ways that existing models of food production workforce development programs, so case studies here, how can these support recommendations that can be made in collaboration with seafood industry members for potential application in the state of Georgia? And I have to pause here because this is a very important thing uh, for all of my collaborators and I. We work very hard to incorporate students, student research and student training into all of our research projects. And so uh, over the course of this project, you can see we were incorporating graduate students in paid positions or in collaborative positions. I want to give a shout out to UGA and their ICON program, their integrated conservation program uh, for developing the guidelines for the social network methods that we used many, many undergraduate students at Emory at Georgia Southern, uh, especially some you'll hear about in just a minute, who uh, did some, some very intensive on the ground research with us. And then lastly, for volunteers, uh, we, Tracy and I have been very lucky in that we have many students who have become involved in our projects over time. So as you see this project, please know that these sorts of research findings on fisheries issues have reached out and touched uh, dozens and dozens of students across Georgia, really. Um, over the last two or three years. So we used multiple research methods to get at this data. We were incorporating both qualitative and quantitative methods. We're wanting the quantitative data, such as the survey responses, the historical demographic data, to be complemented by the richness of qualitative strategies. And here we're looking at interviews and participant observation. And of course, the primary importance to all of us on this project, um, continuing across this project and others, is doing collaborative work with the seafood industry. We're very much using participatory research. We're emphasizing the involvement of local people in the research process, because we know that industry insiders have an en enhanced ability to identify the key elements of the problems and possible solutions. And so I'm gonna keep coming back to this slide just to help ground you in where I'm going in this presentation today. Uh, we were using these six different methods and data sources. 
And in doing this, we're increasing our confidence in our development of accurate and effective findings and recommendations. And so I'm going to start today with case study, and I'm going to move clockwise around this blue and green pie to describe a bit about the different methods. And then I'll offer more in-depth data, particularly about economic conditions in the industry and the physical locations of infrastructure on the coast. And then I'll finish up with recommendations we made. And again, this is a very brief snapshot of uh, the data that's contained in that longer report. So we started off with case study work looking at existing workforce development programs. We were studying these as models for Georgia seafood industry. We were looking for situations where training was going on, where certain skills were necessary in different food production or seafood production industries. We were looking at situations where maybe the labor force wasn't sufficient to the needs of the situation. This happens a lot in fishing, but we also see it in farming. And so we took this information and compiled a database of relevant examples to try to inform recommendations for similar development in Georgia. And so you can see sort of a sample of that database here and the sorts of information we were looking for. Um, and a few examples, you know, here you see specifically, we were looking at the programs carried out by Alaska's Fisheries Technology Program or Louisiana Fisheries Forward. Uh, one that we've come back to over and over is the Farmer Veteran Coalition that links uh, retiring farmers who, you know, are, are aging out of active farming with veterans who've returned home from their service and are interested in farming and need some of that mentorship. And so each of these we saw as really models that could be used in the industry that might give us some ideas and some hints moving forward and assessing the best paths forward for the industry. And so these are case studies that we brought up, especially um, when we were doing the in-depth interviews with seafood industry to see which of these might be best practices or potential issues uh, to, for implementation in Georgia. So the next research method I want to talk about is the mapping. A uh, primary goal of the study was to create a census, a map, of seafood industry infrastructure in coastal Georgia. And this task was really difficult. Uh, there's an absence of contemporary accurate data. So we had to get creative. We had to rely on existing historical as well as anecdotal evidence and found that many of the previous studies are contradictory. Uh, for example, what you see screenshotted here is a 1975 study uh, by Nix, Glenn, and Witted, where they identified 31 commercial docks in Georgia. So 1975, 31 docks. And yet in 2006, Benjamin Blunt, uh, who did research across the coast as well, found 21 in McIntosh County alone. Um, so there was a lot of discrepancies between these bits of historical data that we found. So we started off with then as much of this historical data as we could find from secondary sources, from historical records, from interviews, from the published literature, and did our best to compile sort of a master uh, map identifying previous locations of any docks, any fish houses, any other infrastructure. And then we took the locations of um, everything that we knew of as being currently active fishing industry infrastructure and that we could identify through public records and the interviews that we had conducted. And we took all this on the road, as we say. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Yandel led us, Tracy led us in a week long um, undergraduate research project, which was part of a special course that she taught at Emory called Coastal Georgia Geography, History and Politics of Fishing Culture. And this was a, a really intensive week-long field work during the student's spring break. And it focused on, of course, the culture, history, and geography of the coastal communities and the fishing industry, but then also the policy and the environmental challenges of fishing. And so Yandel led us that week. Uh, Brian and I each had a separate car. Mr. Flick and I had separate cars as we drove up and down the entire coastline of Georgia for an entire week. We researched the history of each historic and current location, both before we went out and continued to do that on the ground. We dropped GIS points, we geocoded and created photographic records of the current conditions at each one of those historic sites in the spring of 2019. And then uh, Tracy spatially analyzed this information. This information has been mapped 
and it's allowed us to identify and illustrate the changing patterns of industry activity and related land use along the Georgia coast. And of course, just to break it down into numbers because we're still boggled, we managed to accomplish all of this in a week. It was only six days and 10 students and, and three faculty members, but we did travel more than a thousand miles in that uh, week, which is ironic because Georgia's coastline is 100 miles. Uh, but during that, we were able to compile 49 GIS points. Uh, we took more than 850 photos. We trained and educated students um, about oyster hatcheries and took them on the research vessel, the Sea Dog, and they conducted archival research at county libraries. They explored the ecology and the history of the barrier islands. And all of this then fed into their education as well as um, the mapping and the GIS analysis that you'll see the results of in a little bit. But relating to that then is that secondary data gathering. So I mentioned this earlier, wherever it was available, we were gathering existing data on social and economic variables. And we were doing this um, not just for mapping and locations, but also uh, by accessing federal and state and local government websites, looking at reports and repositories from the US Census Bureau or from NOAA's Digital Coast site, uh, we're looking at Georgia corporate records, looking at um, Georgia Department of Natural Resources records, also looking at fisheries related sources like Pew's Charitable Trusts and the World Bank Group. We were also looking at academic research and historical sources, drawing on things like the Georgia State Archives. Um, we made several stops along the way on this trip to spend time in the Brian Lang Historical Archives in Camden County, spent time at the Ida Hilton Public Library in McIntosh County, the Bull Street Archives and Library in Chatham County. And so all of the secondary data gathering, particularly by the students, was really closely supervised by faculty and also the research library staff at Emory's uh, Woodruff Library. So the next data source then was surveys. Um, when we created this project, we planned to survey all of the key participant groups in Georgia's coastal seafood industry. And with assistance from Ms. Julie Kayla from Georgia DNR, we were able to receive the state database of individuals who hold commercial fishing licenses for finfish, shrimp, shellfish, and crabs. And with that list then, we started to craft a survey and sent out a warning postcard, which is what you see in the image above, uh, to do a few things. Number one, to alert these license holders that we would be mailing questionnaires, printed surveys to their homes soon and uh, requesting that they would fill out as much of it as they were able to. And we know that the literature shows that the sort of warning then helps to improve response rates. Uh, secondly, we were also trying to determine which addresses in that database may not be accurate. And so we could avoid mailing that really kind of expensive mailed questionnaire. And so we then crafted culturally appropriate surveys. We were paying careful attention to the, attention to the accuracy of our phrasing, um, recognizing the value of respondents' time, their willingness to participate, really uh, mulling over how best to handle some of these really sensitive questions that we were asking. Uh, practically speaking, this was a tremendous undertaking. There was a lot of paper. <laughs> it resulted in the handling of many pieces of paper. Uh, the generous volunteer labor of Georgia Southern students, you can see in that picture there, who, who gave of their own time to come and fold surveys for me. And ultimately, on May 19th of 2019, we sent out 972 paper questionnaires in the U.S. mail. And with each questionnaire, we included a $1 bill in the envelope. Uh, the literature shows that enclosing a single $1 bill in a paper mail questionnaire increases the response rate. Uh, unfortunately, in the end, our response rate was lower than we expected, and this affected our ability to do many of the statistical analyses that we had originally planned. And we'll come back to this in recommendations at the end, but just uh, very briefly, based on the data that we received, it really looks like there are two reasons for this low response rate. Uh, firstly, that the Department of Natural Resources definitions of commercial fishers include individuals who wish to use particular gear that's only allowable under commercial fishing license. Um, and the example that was given in several of the return surveys was using gill nets for shad. An individual person who doesn't wish to sell shad still has to have a commercial license to use a gill net to catch shad is what, is what they told us or um, they might wish to harvest larger quantities for their personal or family use than is allowable under recreational use. So if you have a family who's wanting to 
uh, cast net for shrimp from the beach, you know, the quantities that they can take in are much smaller if they don't have a commercial license. And so what we found then is these estimates of the numbers of commercial fishers that come from this database that are actually commercially fishing is artificially inflated by the way that this is um, handled and licensed. Secondly, we were asking sensitive questions. We we're asking questions about income and money and health and substance abuse. And we know these can, no matter how carefully they're worded, still reduce response rates. So we had planned to originally to survey all of the key participant groups in Georgia's coastal seafood industry, as you see here. Um, but in fact, we chose to narrow down this pool just a bit. For several of the population groups, the size of the group was small enough or their identities and locations uncertain enough uh, that we chose to instead find them individually and uh, target them for more in-depth qualitative interviews. And so of those 975 surveys we sent out, we received 91 responses back. And unfortunately, 51 of those were excluded from the analysis because they did not identify their main fishery or because they turned out to be non-commercial operators despite holding commercial fishing licenses. And so that remaining 40 responses then formed the basis for what became descriptive statistics that are provided in the report and in this presentation. And so where possible, we conducted uh, inferential statistics and within, within the report, we note statistical tests and p-values that we obtained. So despite these limitations, we were still able to gather important quantitative and qualitative data that can help inform current and future policy directions and future data needs. So after the surveys then, um, the next component of data that we gathered were interviews. We conducted individual semi-structured interviews with individuals across each of those four subpopulations that you saw in that last chart. Our recruitment was grounded in purposive sampling. We were seeking out knowledgeable individuals and then that was followed by snowball sampling from the initial contacts to others that the participant thought would be informative to us. Of course, semi-structured interviews are valuable because they allow for a deep understanding of a research topic. They encapsulate the experience of these individuals. So they uh, are guided in their semi-structured in that we do have an interview guide and a general script, but they're open-ended to allow for new information to emerge while we're still making sure that we cover the desired topics. And of course, this interviewing style allows the researcher to steer the interviews around to the issue of, uh, the issue of interest and then let the informants teach us. Um, so these interviews are really valuable in highlighting new information that we don't know to ask, um, but then also providing the why behind any of the quantitative statements that we're able to make. So you can see here, uh, we did have a goal in each of these four populations of the minimum number of people that we did want to interview. And, and I'm happy to report we met those goals uh, because you know it's, it's harder to avoid an interview than it is to avoid sending back a mailed survey. Uh, lastly, we conducted a very traditional anthropological research method, which is participant observation. And so participant observation is being in a situation and observing and learning. And this is something that we conducted throughout the entire project, uh, as well as previous projects in Georgia and coastal Georgia. Um, we were looking at people's interactions. We're looking at nonverbal communications among the commercial seafood industry. We're looking at the themes and the topics that are of interest to each group that they bring up spontaneously and wish to tell us about. Uh, we, our research included participant observation on fishing docks and in fish houses, in fishers' homes, in their backyard seafood processing operations. We spent time in the seafood processing facilities of large and small distribution companies. Uh, we went on a shrimp research vessel. We were on oyster flats and an oyster skiff. We were in retail and wholesale seafood spaces, really across these six coastal counties, periodically and regularly over the last seven to eight years. We've held countless informal conversations with local extension agents, with state and federal employees, with fisheries management staff, with chefs who want to purchase Georgia seafood. And all of that uh, situates and confirms the data that emerges through the other data collection methods throughout our research. So we engaged in these numerous casual and unstructured interviews as well with a variety of fishing community members throughout the study period. And all of this serves to frame 
and contextualize the 23 in-depth qualitative interviews that we conducted with members of the commercial fishing industry between February of 2018 and February of 2020 for this project. Because by repeatedly and consistently immersing ourselves in these communities, we're able to gather data beyond what is reported to us. And of course, we're able to then take our recorded observations of behavior and interactions and compare them to the stated sentiments from the study informants. And that way we can triangulate that reported data with what is being systematically observed. So in brief, uh, these ambitious plans resulted in some areas of success, some with less success. Uh, we did complete more than the planned number of individual semi-structured in-depth interviews with individuals across each subpopulation. And again, we had the res a return of 91 quantitative male surveys from people who were officially registered commercial fishers in Georgia, uh, but that didn't necessarily play out in, in good data that we could use. Um, in keeping with that multidisciplinary nature of the research team and the project, we used five different data analysis methods. I'm going to start with qualitative at the top. We were using qualitative data to, uh, for anthropological and for policy analysis. And of course, this analysis is from the participant observation that I just described and also interviewing. Qualitative data lets researchers better understand the why and the how of human behavior. And so this incorporated transcription of the audio interviews, review and coding of those interviews, reviewing field notes from the participant observation, and reviewing themes that emerged across all of these methodologies. And the sample size, while low for quantitative analysis, is perfectly sufficient for a qualitative, culturally rich analysis of these issues. We also conducted a social network analysis, and this was a sort of a sub project of this larger project. It was led by graduate students um, and the ICON students at UGA developed the social network research tools and a guideline for social network analysis. And what we had hoped these data would provide us with modeling of the figures in the seafood industry who all their peers deemed the most reliable and forward thinking, the really small sample size and honestly, a, a lack of collective trust among fishing community members really made that analysis less useful than we had anticipated. And I'm happy to answer questions about that uh, later. The project used quantitative analysis for economics, for policy analysis purposes where appropriate. Um, this approach was using data from the mailed, the mailed survey and other secondary data sources such as the US Census Bureau to conduct statistical analyses where possible or to do descriptive statistics where it wasn't. Um, the economic analysis was using, again, the data gathered from secondary sources, the mailed questionnaire and the interviews. Um, and we were also able to quantitatively document the current state of the fishing sector and make some statistical comparisons between fisheries. Um, I'd like to stop here and just point out very openly that I am not an economist. This is not my piece of this pie. Uh, so as we get to the question and answer, answer period, I will likely not be able to answer uh, any economic questions sufficiently, but I will be very, very good at writing them down because I know that Dr. Shamshak would love to engage in conversation and answer any of those economic or quantitative questions. So please do share them with me and know that I will pass them along and I'm happy to get back to anyone who has specific questions there. And lastly, we conducted spatial analysis and, and also I should say this was very much Dr. Yandel's analysis and her part of the pie. Uh, so please forgive me if I can't give you specifics at any of these points, but again, I'm happy to pass along questions. So here we were looking at current and historic locations of seafood industry infrastructure, and we mapped the changes in the spatial location of those activities over time. And then those data have been topically linked to the survey results to try to give us a better understanding of the relationships between seafood industry economic activity and the characteristics of industry participants, and then the broader communities on the coast. So I'd like to dive in with just a few um, in-depth looks at some of the data that came out in uh, two areas specifically. I'd like to look at some of the survey responses that I think might be most interesting to this audience and some of the spatial analysis that I think might be most interesting. Uh, so I'd like to start off by just sharing a little bit of demographic data. Of course, this is a very small sample size in no way, shape or form is this representative of the industry uh, because of the way in which the data was gathered. But from the data that we did receive back, we found that the average age of the respondents was 55.67, so about 55 and a half years old. 
And then we broke this down by fishery, as you can see along the left-hand side. Uh, finfish average age was about 53. The crab, crabber's average age was nearly 56, and shrimper's average age was uh, nearly 58, so 57 and a half. When we asked them how long they had worked fishing, then the responses from fin fishers were about 22 years, crabbers a little more than 30 years, and shrimpers nearly 33 years. The majority of respondents in this question were the first in their family to participate in the seafood industry. Um, and only one crabber reported being the fourth generation to participate in the industry. Now, in terms of educational attainment, there was a, a wide range of responses, which you don't see on the list here, but the most common response being high school was completed. Um, you can also see on this chart that uh, we've recorded, or Dr. Shamshak has recorded, the age of the vessels uh, that each of these different fisheries was operating. So you can see the shrimp vessels being operated were, were considerably older than the crab boats being operated. Next, I would like to talk about the number of days worked in the main fishery in the year. And there was a statistically significant difference between the average number of days reported by crabbers uh, versus fin fishermen or um, the average number of days worked by shrimp participants. And uh, Gina did tell me that I need to make sure to tell you uh, that this was a significant p-value using the Welch test. And so the majority of the respondents also across all of those fisheries captained a boat that they owned themselves. Interestingly, there was a statistically significant difference between the reported share of the catch that sold at the dock. So nearly 67% of the crabbers said that they sold none of their catch at the dock, while over 64% of the shrimpers said that they sold 100% of their catch at the dock. And this is using the Welch test again. Fin fish respondents, for 50% of them, they reported selling no catch at the dock and 30% of them reported selling 100% of it at the dock. So this again might be getting at the difference between um, people who hold a commercial fishing license for intended commercial sale purposes versus hold a fishing license because they must have it for that type of fishing. We also looked at the economic conditions of the fishery from multiple angles. Uh, we asked questions related to their income and the financial viability in the fishery, and that's what you see on the right-hand side here. And there was also a statistically significant difference between the income that was reported from fishing uh, for crabbers versus finfish respondents. We also asked about the degree to which respondents were satisfied with their fishing income, and that's what you see in the table on the left. Again, these tables are in the report and would be probably much easier to view there. But after asking these questions, we also asked questions about the economic conditions of their main fishery, of their local community, and their country. So when we asked them to rate economic conditions in their main fishery, you can see there was sort of some diversity in their responses. Um, On this chart, you can see that gray and yellow are good and excellent. And so it's clear that crabbers were definitely more satisfied with the economic conditions in their fishery than shrimpers were, or than finfish were, fin fishers were. When we asked them to rate those same economic conditions in their local community, uh, crabbers found it even better and shrimpers found it far worse. So there's an interesting shift between their own fishery and then their local community. Yet when we ask them to broaden that question to the country as a whole, you can see that shrimpers were, were far more satisfied with economic conditions in the country um, and crabbers less so. I will just mention a reminder again, this was 2019, um, so this was under a previous administration. So I wanna change gears now and talk a bit about our spatial analysis. Historic data, as I mentioned earlier, on the distribution of fishing infrastructure in Georgia is really sparse. Uh, the starting point for this analysis, again, is that 1975 Georgia Sea Grant funded report titled The Locational Inventory of Docks and Shrimp Trawlers on the Coast of Georgia. And so while it is the best available historic record of docks at that point in time, it really cannot be regarded as comprehensive. Um, for example, really with very minimal effort, we stumbled onto one shrimp dock in Darien that is closed now, 
that was not in the Nick study, but a local source confirmed it was definitely open in 1975. So we really don't know how comprehensive that locational inventory was, but it is what we have to work with. And so with the support of those undergraduate students, every site that was identified in 1975 was visited on the ground, geolocated with latitude and longitude, and current site conditions and status, whether they were open or closed, was documented. And in addition to that, the team conducted open record searches on all of those properties to compile the ownership histories of each site. And so what you see in this map here, which I know is hard to, it's hard to capture the entirety of the Georgia coast in a map that's legible and viewable on uh, your screen. But what you see here is the location and the status of each dock on this map. These were all identified in 1975. And so the ones that you see in red were open in 1975, but when we returned in 2019, they were closed. The ones that you see in green were recorded in 1975 and are still operating today. So we also know, our analysis showed, I'm sorry, that of the 34 docks that were open in 1975, 13 of them are open today. So 35% of them are still open. And as would be expected, many uh, the use of these sites has changed, changed significantly over time. And that's what's summarized in this chart here. Uh, historic and current uses were coded as being docks, processors, marine rails, or marinas. And many sites were coded more than once, um, as was appropriate, for 1975. And then for um, 2019, they were coded as dock, processor, marine rail, marina, restaurant, residential, abandoned, wholesale, retail, part of another dock, and other things that we just could not fit into any other category. And so here we can see a shift in the infrastructure use. Um, if you see that the yellow bars are 1975 and the blue bars are 2019, we can see that the number of docks was decreasing and the processing facilities increased slightly and the majority of the docks now also have processing capacity. And so when those, over time, many of those combined with some of the other docks. And so because there are fewer, the suggests that the industry is really experiencing a large degree of consolidation in these um, sites and in this infrastructure. Marine rail capacity has reduced and it's probably more than estimated. Uh, Nix et al. didn't document this infrastructure. And so this was, again, drawing on different records. And among the infrastructure that's no longer in use for docks, the most frequent category here is abandoned, followed by restaurants, retail, and then this catch-all category of other. And this suggests that while some infrastructure has been converted to different uses, there's really also just a true loss of broader social and economic productivity on those sites when the facilities are simply just lost. And so in our interviewing and in our participant observation, we had many discussions with people in the industry and multiple hypotheses emerged to try to explain these dock closures. The two dominant ones that we heard um, multiple times over were that the distance to legal, legally fishable waters um, had made some of those docks economically uncompetitive, meaning that when the sounds were closed to shrimping, that the distance that needed to be travel from the, traveled from the docks that were uh, deep into the estuaries all the way out past the outside of the barrier islands was just too far. It resulted in too much gas being spent to get out to those legal fishing grounds. Um, docks that were close to I-95 and the I-95 corridor, which opened in Georgia in 1977, gained a competitive advantage though. And so uh, a test comparing the observed and expected open and closed docks and their status of near to I-95 or fishable waters, though, didn't really show any statistically significant difference in the categories. So neither of them is really sufficient to fully explain the pattern of dock closures. And instead, it's probably likely to be more external influences, the overall decrease in the shrimping industry due to competition from imports, increased price of gas, etc. So in addition to mapping those changes over time, we also analyzed where fishing industry infrastructure is presently located and its current uses. And so again, we began with the open docks that were identified in the NIC 75 study and then expanded based on a multitude of sources, but uh, predominantly Sea Grant personnel's expertise and observation. 
They're very um, engaged with the local communities. They're on the ground on a regular basis, and they're very plugged into the commercial seafood industry. And so really drawing on the expertise of multiple people at the Marine Extension helped us to know places to go look. And really our analysis is designed to capture a broader view of the seafood industry. And we're looking here at, at docks and processing, rails, marinas, restaurants, residentials, wholesale, parts of the other docks retail. And that sort of analysis identified 26 new facilities which are on this map. We also documented contemporary use of the spaces. So I've mentioned all of the different uh, ways that they are in use. And so using GIS and geospatial data, we've compiled, we've compiled a map just like this one for each of those six coastal counties. So that at a glance, we know what's actually happening at each of these current docks. So those were just some snapshots of uh, the data that we collected and the meanings behind it. And so I'd like to wrap up now with what we ended this project with, which were our key findings and recommendations going forward to improve these situations or these scenarios. And so one of our key findings, which it shouldn't be a surprise uh, based on the comments I've made, is that our research shows that there are fewer active commercial seafood producers and harvesters than appear to be practicing in Department of Natural Resources data. Um, in some cases, individuals have or intend to use their permits to catch commercial quantities of seafood in order to sell it to make a profit, of course, commercial fishing. But in other cases, these individuals just want to catch more seafood than is allowable under recreational harvest, or they want to utilize different gear than is allowed under recreational fishing regulations. And so going forward, if this discrepancy wanted to be captured, if there was a desire to capture this difference, then more nuance in data record keeping could give us a better understanding of the realities of the fishing industry. Um, some standardized documentation about what information is publicly available from DNR, and then clarification about fisher intentions to actually commercially sell seafood might help to illuminate some of these conflicts. Secondly, and this is something that came up numerous times, changes in the local ecosystem and the environment are likely impacting the seafood that is available to resource users. Uh, time and again, we heard observations from crabbers, from shellfish pickers, from shrimpers about environmental changes affecting the nursery grounds in the creeks and the marshes and their concerns about them, uh, they feel are not valued or not heard. Uh, specifically, this is seen in crabber concerns that draining of marshland inland to be used for pine agriculture has changed the salinity of the downstream waterways, thus reducing the habitat for crabs and shrimp nurseries. It's possible that the biomass of the most commercially important species have declined over the last few decades. Uh, to the best of our understanding, blue crab biomass is uh, not actively tracked in a way um, that could could really speak to the issue and it could be that increased harvest of softshell crabs could be impacting the size of the subsequent crab populations. Shrimpers are really concerned about the apparent decline in the visible quantity of the species but and this is key these concerns are not often raised publicly. They are afraid that the sentiment may result in further restrictions upon the industry, um, more seasonal closures, more gear restrictions, further restrictions on limited entry licenses. So a recommendation going forward from a research team is that there really needs to be, and, and this is not new information for many of you, and this is not to say this isn't happening, um, but there really does need to be this effort to incorporate fishing industry concerns into environmental management. Um, the cultural and political perspectives of some fishing communities in Georgia make them unlikely to concur with science that appears environmental or politically biased in any way. Uh, but there is definitely an opportunity for the use of very carefully designed scientific appeals to shared common concerns about the local land, about the waterways and the marshes. There's opportunity for long-term meaningful collaboration between the local communities who spend their lives in the ecosystem and the scientists um, and the management agents at agencies and organizations who hold similar goals. Since the shrimp and the crab industry are financially important to the coast and their product is dependent on these healthy wetlands, it's really vital for the success of the industry that Georgia's coastal wetlands are appropriately managed and preserved in a way that is um, culturally appropriate in these locations. 
A third key finding is that, as we've talked about, infrastructure is dwindling. There are no public or municipal dock options in Georgia. The commercial fishing industry of Georgia relies entirely on privately owned docks to sustain their operations. And with a decrease in privately owned dock spaces to support fishers, there will not be sufficient capacity to keep boats running, to keep boats stocked with ice, or to offload most of the product if the infrastructure continues to dwindle as it has been. Deep water, waterfront property demands high property taxes. They're really difficult to support on a small profit margin that's received by many of these docks. So across these 100 miles of coastline, there are only two remaining railways. And as of 2019, only one of them was able to handle the larger steel hold freezer boats, which are increasingly being adopted by the industry. So of the 31 docks identified in that 1975 docks survey, 13 of them were still operating. And an additional two docks were operating in 2018 that weren't identified or weren't open in that initial study. And so this is a decline of over 50%. But there's no discernible pattern in these dock closures. So it doesn't appear to be driven by a locally based cause. Instead, these dock closures appear to reflect the overall national decline of the fishing industry. And so the recommendation that comes out of these observations is that there really needs to be the consideration of local and state policy interventions to try to preserve this infrastructure. And it was unclear to us at the time of this report um, if it's not already the current practice in urban or gentrifying areas, the, the local municipalities really need to consider taxing active working commercial fishing docks at a lower rate than nearby residential property. And state and local governments may consider the provision of municipal commercial docks, including access to ice and fuel services, as a means of preserving not only the industry, but also local culture that attracts tourists and residents. And then lastly, the last key finding um, is that what we see a lot of in Georgia are older, smaller boats, and they're not able to attract the quality of the crew labor force that younger captains with larger boats who stay out longer are attracting. The volume of the product and thus the crew share of the landings has to be appealing enough to balance the required time offshore and the intense physical labor. Uh, they're over and over again, uh, our interviewers, interviews raise the point that um, captains and boat owners are just not able to hire a dependable, hardworking crew. And this is probably, in fact, due to the poor financial viability of the fishing trips. Um, and many people who we interviewed acknowledge this, that this was the number one issue. If we could pay a little more, we could get a little better quality employees. And so this is something um, that is not new information. But the recommendation then that we can come to from this data is that smaller day boats really might be better able to compete on quality than quantity. That if there are opportunities to encourage a shift in the industry to higher margin opportunities, such as direct marketing or community supported fisheries or dock front sales, that this would be an opportunity where these smaller day boats could really shine and these increased profits would allow them to hire a more qualified workforce going forward. So that was a lot of information uh, in, in a fairly short presentation. Um, and again, I've only just touched on a lot of the issues that came out of this data, and, and I've actually completely ignored several of the big, big issues that came out um, just in the interest of time. But I do wanna just pause and again, thank Georgia Sea Grant and UGA Marine Extension for supporting this research project. This was um, an institutional grant uh, from the National Sea Grant Office. And of course, any problems or views or errors uh, belong entirely to us. But if you do have any questions or any comments that I can't answer now, or you'd just like to follow up with us later, please do reach out to us. This is my email here, jtooks at georgiasouthern.edu. And the report that I mentioned, as well as all outreach materials that we have created on this project or other projects on coastal Georgia or in the Caribbean, working with fishing communities can all be found at workingwaterfronts.org. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time today and answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Let me switch back to my screen. All right, so um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I, I see you unmuted yourself for a second, Jennifer, if you wanna speak. I'm just hoping everyone's still awake. Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. 
Of course we are. That was it was really interesting uh, materials, and I was just wondering if anyone uh, had any questions. All right, Graham Gaines, I have unmuted you, and it appears you're unmuted. Yeah, hey Jennifer, thanks for that presentation. That was really interesting. Um, so my name is Graham Gaines. I'm with South Carolina Sea Grant, and we are supporting the South Carolina Seafood Alliance to do a very similar study. And we're actually a good bit through the process of data collection. Um, I had a question about the uh, about docks, um, docks themselves, and how you define a dock. Uh, so you mentioned um, that there there's no public docks that are used for landing commercial catch. So I just wanted to confirm that that's that's correct that nobody uses public docks for for crabbing or, or uh, any kind of near shore fisheries or oystermen don't use those for, um, for landing their catch. And, and also how you define a dock, because we, we have that issue here in South Carolina. I'm just wondering what parameters you use since a lot of docks are private and you could kind of in theory uh, tie up any boat and land some some crabs at the thousands of private docks that exist. What did you use to differentiate between the docks that you counted for here and, and other private docks? That's a great question, Graham. Uh, and it's nice to see you here. I think we crossed paths years ago. Um, so it's good to see your name popping up again. I've heard good work about this project you're working on as well. Um, but that that's an interesting question. Um, Chip, can you confirm that y'all can hear me? I, I just realized. I could be talking yes. to myself. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when we were talking about docks in this particular scenario, we we first of all were working off of the, the Nix et al. survey. And so they had really clearly delineated docks as being, um, you know, freestanding structures at which you could tie a boat that's too large to remove from the water. And so that's what we, and it's funny because this is something we've sort of just assumed we're all on the same page, um, but we do see, as you're saying, crabbers and oyster boats that are being put in and out of the water every day. Um, but these are boats that are smaller and they're being trailered and most of these are using uh, public boat ramps. So they're actually, you know, taking that boat in and out of the water um, as far, and, and so those are public, you're absolutely correct. But as far as the docks, we're talking about structures where something the size of a shrimp boat or, you know, something larger than some of those trailerable boats um, can be tied up and left overnight or left, you know, uh, off season, that sort of thing. Great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your question. Christina Wiegand. Thanks for taking the time to give us this presentation, Jennifer. Uh, you were talking a little bit about sort of consolidation of infrastructure from back in the 70s to now. And when we're looking at you know, analyzing regulations and doing social impact analyses and looking at you know, community fishing dependence, we tend to look at it on a really hyper level. But given the loss of infrastructure, do you think that we're probably getting to the point where we need to be considering a more regional approach where you know a single fish house or a processor or dock is no longer just serving one community but community but it's actually supporting multiple communities across a larger area thank you so much for your kind words christina i'm excited to be here uh, and to talk about this so this is tricky right this is a great question um when if you noticed on that you know the map of the infrastructure that's still open in 2019 um one of the issues that's really coming out is that you know when we look at the georgia coastline it's not a straight flat coast you know we, we drove a thousand miles in a week just trying to get to all of the docks on this 100 mile long coastline and so even though it may look on a map that, you know, a dock or a fish house in Darien should be able to service the dock, uh, you know, boats that are um, fishing off of Brunswick, in reality, there's so much travel time needed to get from one of these key areas where these docks are out to the water and then back that it's not practical in many ways uh, for shrimpers to be able to um, work on a more like you're saying a more centralized or regional sort of model it um, would be economically 
really detrimental to what they're able to do, especially a lot of the smaller day boats. Did that answer your question, Christina? Absolutely, it did. And I just I want to monopolize this. I know there are other people who likely have other questions, but given this consolidation that we're seeing and what you were just talking about, the fact that it's not always economically feasible for these boats to travel longer distances along the coast, when you were doing some of these interviews and the more in-depth cultural studies, particularly when talking to fishermen who've been in the industry for quite some time, did they give you a little bit of insight into sort of how this loss of working waterfront has changed their fishing behavior, particularly in terms of when and where they actually choose to fish? Definitely so, definitely so. And even, you know, thinking, I, I will respond to their their individual stories in a, in a moment, uh, but even thinking about, you know, the consolidation that we saw when the sounds were closed, and I don't remember the exact year, but I see Brian's on here, so he might be able to chime in and help me. Uh, when the sounds were closed, uh, that meant that a lot of the docks that had been further inland that had been active and thriving docks during you know, years of being able to shrimp in the sounds were no longer usable for people who had to then you know, motor out all the way offshore or at least within the state waters on the outside of the barrier islands. You know, so we see that that had that effect back when the sounds closed. You know, so if we talked about then trying to further condense or trying to understand if, if we're only gonna prioritize one fish house or one dock or one, one group of docks in the entire region, you know, I, think, I don't think it would be uh, irresponsible of me to, to guess that probably we're gonna see further closure of docks because it just is not, it's not feasible for people to travel that far from you know wherever their boat is docked out to the fishing grounds and then back in um, if that's, especially if it's far removed from their own homes, right? So then we're adding a whole nother layer of uh, movement and of um, commuting basically from home to dock to, to fishing grounds to dock to home. Um, so it, it's just one more layer of difficulty in, in the fishing process. Um, on a personal level, yes, definitely. We were hearing from people who would say, well, I used to dock down here, but then they closed or, um, you know, night seafood ha has been closed for a couple of years now. And we still hear from people who had originally docked there and have had to move to other docks. So it does cause um, a personal shift for people as well and a personal frustration and almost adds to that cyclical sense of loss as things change, uh, you know, and of course the world has changed, things change, um, but a sense for many commercial fishers that um, things only change for the worse, <laughs> you know, that, that their opportunities and their options are increasingly narrowed as the decades or the years of the decades have gone by. And so it just, it further adds to that sense of, of difficulty to overcome and sense of um, loss related to their livelihood. I will ask a question, Jennifer. I was just curious, did the fishermen talk about a loss of the amount of resource that they're bringing in per trip? Was that an issue for them or was it fairly stable over time? You know, it really depends on the day. <laughs> it really does. Uh, you know, there's it's a seasonal crop, right? It's a seasonal harvest. And so there, there are definitely times where we hear that, you know, no year has been as good as 1979. And I literally mean 1979. That's sort of this banner year that came up in multiple interviews. Um, there is there was definitely uh, data to support the idea that they're catching less on each trip. And the sense that the biomass of the shrimp has changed, but many of them attribute that to uh, fishing off of the beaches rather than fishing in the sounds. And so they were catching more in the sounds than they were off the beaches or? In their memory, they were. In their memory, they were. And, and it's an interesting thing to look at, right? We haven't gone back and looked at the landings from those years. I believe that the landings have stayed fairly constant, uh, but perhaps the uh, 
sorry, my mind just went completely blank. I taught all morning, so I used up my brain power uh, <laughs> that the price per uh, basket of shrimp has decreased enough that it feels like a loss, even if the quantity is about the same. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Well, I was hoping Brian was going to jump in here and add some to this, but. Tom Roller, I see you have your hand up. You were unmuted. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Roller. I'm a, I'm a council member uh, from North Carolina. I was curious if you had any insight if industry has adapted to these changes and more specifically has industry that can adapt say like the crabbing industry gone to smaller boats or using more public infrastructure over time because up here in north carolina we have really really good boat ramps and you know there's a a lot of small boat commercial activity and there seems to be more both for hire and uh um you know commercial fishing over the last over since we have um developed a lot of our boat ramps up here and i was wondering if you could uh, offer any insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your question. So we haven't seen much shift in the vessels being used for shrimping. Definitely, you know, these are literally the same boats that were being used in the 70s and the 80s. Um, there have been a few shrimpers who've been interested in using smaller vessels and and maybe one or two efforts, but they, they aren't currently functioning. My understanding, though, in the crabbing workforce is that these are approximately the same size vessels that have always been used, um, that they've always been these, these small boats that are being put in at boat ramps and pulled out uh, regularly. So I don't think there's been really a huge shift in the size of the vessels for them. Um, shrimp wise, we, we are seeing an increase in vessel size as we see fewer of the smaller wooden day boats in Georgia, which, you know, a lot of them would just go out for the day and then come back at night, they're ice boats. Um, but we're seeing um, increasing numbers of of steel hold boats being come in, being brought in from, you know, the Carolinas or up from Florida. Uh, I don't, to the best of my knowledge, there's only maybe one or two, if that, that are um, really from Georgia, not very many at all. So we are seeing a shift in that vessel size in that respect, and those are freezer boats that are doing IQF on board. So that is happening, you know, which is another point of, of, potential concern then as we're seeing you know fewer and fewer docks and these docks are aging and if the size of the vessels the, the vessels is increasing you know we're, we're going to sort of hit that point where the size of the vessel and the size of the dock aren't really as compatible as they need to be for everyone's safety you know which is another reason to to really invest some time and some energy and some uh, financial support into the infrastructure of the docks I, I do want to respond to one other thing. You know, you started off asking about change and their adaptation to change. And something that's just fresh in my mind because we're we're writing the manuscript on it right now is that there has been a lot of adaptation to change in the industry. And a great example of that is the use of excluder devices. And you know, they they may not be everyone's absolute favorite thing when they first start to speak of it, but there's overall been a real acceptance of and adoption of without as much resistance um, of the turtle excluder devices and the bycatch reduction devices. So we do see a shift in their acceptance of things, uh, just maybe not necessarily changes in vessel size in the same way. Did that answer your question, Tom? Yes, absolutely. I was fascinated. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Brian did help you out. Um... Brian Flick <laughs> responded by saying crabbers have definitely adapted as there's no longer processing plants. It's all direct marketing now. Oh, good point. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, there's no crab picking houses, period. Thanks, Brian. Helps to have a collaborator on board, too. <laughs> Any other questions? I am not seeing any. Christina, did you have any more? <laughs> I mean, I think Jen knows that I could probably talk about this stuff with her all day. Um, I guess the only other question I had on my list, and th this is probably asking you to stretch your mind a little bit, Jennifer, from some of the recommendations here to 
uh, applying them in sort of a different way. But you talked a little bit about fishermen not always feeling sort of comfortable a, expressing their concerns with fear of additional regulations and things like that. And do you sort of have any recommendations for the council on how we can do a better job at, you know, engaging and gathering input from all groups involved in the seafood industry? We tend to focus uh, primarily on fishermen, um, but could likely do a better job reaching out to other industry groups, as well as ways that we might be able to create an environment that really facilitates the sharing of some of those overlapping concerns. Um, which I realize is like a huge task and a little bit outside of this, but given your experience working directly with these fishermen, I wonder if you had any sort of recommendations. So an easy question, huh, Christina? Thanks. <laughs> um, so there is concern. There's concern that if they share information about landings, about changes in landings, about you know the reality of what happens on a in on a day in the water in a day on the water uh that that will be used against them essentially uh and many of them will sort of list off well we we admitted we or we we said we caught a turtle once and now we have turtle excluder devices or uh you know we agreed to close the sounds experimentally uh for a year and then they never gave them back right so there's definitely that sense of if they say anything at all then the result of that will likely be negative. Um, I think we all know that that collaborative work and participatory work is key. I can tell you this is not a group that's going to, for the most part, show up for a meeting um, at a certain time, at a certain place, on our schedule, not theirs. It's just not realistic. And and I think that our, our lack of success in mail surveys really supports that. Uh, this in order to actually connect with and build rapport with um, at least the fishing community in Georgia it's a lot of on the ground time it's a lot of showing your face over and over of uh, explaining clearly why you're there and what the outcomes might be uh, you know Brian Flick knows this better than anyone else probably well many of you are at, at Sea Grants and Extensions so I shouldn't say that uh, you know but but really building up that relationship and showing that it's not a one-way street of you give me data and then I will leave and then I'll come back when I want more data but you don't hear from me otherwise uh, so you know a lot of this is relationship building and building a scenario where they they can see the outcome of your work and you know it's it's always funny to us where there are people that we've been going back to for four or five years now that we show up and we'll say hey did you see you know this thing that i mailed you or this manuscript that we wrote that i sent you a copy of and they'll say well it's not really doing any good but we appreciate you trying you know so that sense of you have to build that rapport and that trust for people to want to collaborate with you how to translate that into the much larger scale across you know every territory and community that council has to interact with that's tricky and i wish i had an easy answer for you there uh, but i think that demonstrating that their best interests are also at stake in the decision making is key otherwise they truly feel like the decisions are being made for the environment or the ecosystem and against them Thanks, Jen. I know that was <laughs> not the easiest of question to answer, but I appreciate your input. And I think the staff that we have listening, a couple of whom are going to be spending some time doing some of that on the ground, uh, uh, talking to fishermen, I think, uh, are going to be pleased to hear that recommendation from you. So yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Really nothing beats the face to face. You know, even if they're not thrilled to see you, and even if you get yelled at for a few minutes first, that's okay. <laughs> that's the sort of part of the process. Um, but really letting them see that it matters to you what their opinions and their perspectives are, and that you you hope that it will be ultimately beneficial to them as well as the ecosystem and the biomass. Yeah. All right. Brian Flick has his hand raised. Hey Jim, great job. I, I was just going to add to that too, and I, and I've always joked with my colleagues at Georgia DNR. One of the hardest things for me is getting 
some of our guys just to pick up the phone and call them because sometimes the assumptions that, oh, it's, you know, it's management, but in reality is they're there to help too. And, I, and, and I've tried to say, and I'm not trying to make this sound Pollyanna-like, but you still not, you don't necessarily have to agree with a management action, but I have found that for those shrimpers who have been willing to pick up the phone and actually see that that management, you know, as a, as a person, as an individual, that helps. So, I mean, I, I, it's getting sometimes industry to kind of step outside of their comfort zone on that too, because it's all, and I know you guys are the council. I mean, it's, it's always easy to criticize, a, you know, a, a social media post or, you know, when there's no one there personally, but it's, I do find that when they're able to make that call, even if they disagree on the, the decision, that also helps. So at the end of the day, it's it's it can't just be one side trying to open up. I mean, industry management, Sea Grant, whatnot. And so I, I do feel like that conversation is so huge and often under overlooked. So um, I definitely agree with what Jennifer said on that piece. So how do we motivate that further, Brian? How do we get more of them to pick up the phone and call? One at a time, you know, and, and it's, it's well, and I, and I say that too, because again, I know management, all, you know, a lot of times does get crapped on and, and the reality is that there are individual cases where, no, they are willing to help out and, you know, and it's, I think just, you can't give up. I mean, I just, it, it is frustrating because you're never going to get everybody and that's kind of, the, I mean, managing people, that's what we're, that's what they're doing. That's that the, the resource itself is the easy part of my opinion, but um you know, just continuing those conversations. And I, I mean, no offense, but I often called the academic one night stand and you said it perfectly. It's like you do the research and get in and get out. And it's like that and not you, but that happens a lot. And, you know, I think for a lot of these decisions, especially on the community level, I mean, we hear fishermen say, I feel like all we're doing is getting surveyed, 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 interviewed, nonstop, nonstop. When do, where do we see that return on investment? And, and I, I, you know, I, I can sympathize with them because there is there's a lot of needed information um and i don't think that's just in fisheries i think that's in so many coastal issues and and you know when we're interviewing people but being mindful that when you have a small audience like this that yeah there's a lot of information coming at and you know when they don't see that return um and i jennifer i think you said it well too trying to understand i think it, at the very least when we do these studies reporting back to them i mean that i know that doesn't necessarily solve all the issues but that is definitely one step I think is important is being able to say, hey, this is how this information is being used, or this is what we, remember when you spoke with us last year, this is what we did. I do think that goes a long way too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we've seen that in action. And I tease you, Ryan, but I wanted to to actually echo what you were saying. I know that you've worked really hard to, to bridge that gap between management and fishers in Georgia. And I know you've successfully gotten some people to literally pick up the phone and call DNR and say, hey, did you know this or did you want to know this? And, and we've heard it. You know, I have to vouch for Ryan that we've heard them say, oh, wow, you know, DNR has really got our back and, uh, you know, having a positive outcome from some of those interactions. So, I mean, aside from having Brian Flick in every county across the, the whole South Atlantic, though, I'm not sure how to motivate that. Yeah, unfortunately, there's only one Brian. Um, Brian Nick Smiley. Many other people on here, I'm sure, though, that are doing that same good work. I just don't work with them as closely as I do with Brian. Uh, Nick Smiley, I see you have a question. Your hand up. Yep, I have my hand up. Um, hey, Jennifer, that was an excellent presentation and um, and really enlightening on a lot of fronts. I work at the the Council as the Citizen Science Project Coordinator, and I'm uh, often in the field and, and trying to gauge those face-to-face -face, um, interactions. And um, I just want to emphasize too that the importance of personal communication um, and along with, like Brian said, um, the meaningful feedback is really important too, um, almost as like a retentive tool, just keeping people engaged um, and knowing that you still think about them, you know, after that, the quote unquote one night stand of science or academia. but. I had a question um, about the cultural impact of the, the decreasing amount of working waterfronts. Did any of your interviewees talk about um, almost like a depreciation of cultural significance in these places? Oh yeah, definitely. And thank you for your kind words. That was, really, was very nice of you, Nick. Uh, definitely so. And it's not just with the working waterfronts, it's, it's also with the fishing grounds as well. And this has come up in several projects, especially that Brian and I have engaged in over the last few years on doing oral histories with fishing communities. Um, there's very much a sense that this 
this is not just a work location for many commercial fishers, right? This is a place where your, your father, your grandfather, your uncle taught you this craft, this trade. Uh, there's for many fishers, it ties into religious beliefs and, you know, Christian biblical ideas about fishing. Uh, you know, we've heard many times, you know, to be a fisher of men as well as, you know, that fishing is the oldest profession and um, Jesus blessed the fishers, right? So there's, there's this religious element, then there's being tied to a place and a livelihood being taught to them by their family. Um, and many of them who are no longer with us, right? So then when when they, when they the dock is gone, when the dock closes, when that sound is closed, when they can't fish in the same places anymore, it's not just a loss of that particular location where they caught a lot of shrimp. It's a loss of all of the, of the importance of family and of heritage that goes along with that. Um, you know, I had crabbers talk to me about uh, the changing biomass of the blue crab, as they called it, uh, that they they thought that there were fewer blue crabs. They um, weren't happy with uh, increased soft shell catch. And it wasn't that this particular individual was upset that he couldn't make a livelihood. I mean, he was upset about that. But he said, the worst part is this is a skill that my father taught me and my granddaddy taught him and my great granddaddy taught him. And I'm the first one that cannot do this for my livelihood because the crabs, there just aren't enough there anymore. You know, so it, it was definitely a loss of a cultural heritage piece of a family history piece, in addition to it being a loss of livelihood. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder if there would be, um, I don't know if there's any research on quantifying, you know, um, I guess the intrinsic and cultural significance of of these places or even a species in general It'd be really interesting yeah i i mean brian and i do a lot of the oral history work and our our interviews are up on noah's voices oral history archives you know to make that accessible as far as quantifying it you know i'm a qualitative researcher at heart i work with excellent quantitative researchers but as a qualitative researcher at heart i don't know that a number is going to capture the lived experience of this right. i think is, you know, I, I could say to you, 52% of the, you know, the, the yeah. commercial fishers in Georgia said that this affected them. Uh, but I don't know that you can really quantify it beyond to say how common it is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that great question and for the good work you're doing. I know you're on the front lines. Oh, yeah. It's fun stuff. It, it really right. is, right? Even when you get yelled at. So thank you yeah. for doing it. <laughs> All right, Wilson Laney has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chip. Hi, Jennifer, great presentation. Thank you for taking the time to, to give that to us. I have what I, I think is sort of a tangential question, and I, I, I just was wondering if it came up uh, in any of your interviews in particular. Um, and, and the question is, has any of the, uh, I think I would characterize it as adverse publicity about seafood mislabeling or misidentification. Um, did any of that come up in your interviews as as you know as a negative factor in people's uh, willingness to purchase you know locally caught fresh seafood? I was just wondering, and I I, I would you know, specifically reference the work done at uh, UNC Chapel Hills Institute of Marine Sciences by Dr. John Bruno and his students, you know, who have fanned out over the Southeast and done a lot of DNA uh, sampling and, and determined that, uh, you know, if, if you purchase what you thought was local shrimp or red snapper, it may in fact not be, it might be something else. So I just wondered if that came up in any of your interviews as a negative factor that, that might, um, you know, possibly discourage uh, seafood purchase or consumption or may even precipitate, you know, the early retirement of some uh, commercial fishers. Thank you so much for your kind words, Wilson. Uh, this is really interesting. So I'm actually, I have two different answers for you, really. Uh, the first is that for years now, uh, commercial fishers have been talking to us about 
how important it is that people buy local seafood, that they're buying Georgia product, that they're buying seafood that they know is from the state of Georgia, or even, you know, sometimes they'll even admit, well, from the U.S., that it really does need to be wild caught. There's definitely a strong sense that buying other seafood that people don't know is Georgia shrimp specifically, right? Because we have, what, like two fin fish licenses in Georgia right now. Uh, so there's definitely that sense. Uh, and there's, you know, they have fun bumper stickers that friends don't let friends eat imported shrimp and uh, say no to drugs, don't eat imported shrimp, you know, things like that. So that's, there's definitely a sense of uh, the need for people to understand what seafood they're buying. And there's definitely a sense of frustration with the common public who doesn't understand that eating wild caught Georgia shrimp is going to be a different experience than eating farm raised Indonesian shrimp. Right. So there's a frustration with that and a desire for uh, the American public to eat American seafood. Definitely. That being said, uh, you know, while I'm familiar with a lot of the work that was done, probably not within the last year or three years or so. I know we've had a lot of seafood misidentification research done and DNA testing and such, which is fascinating and which goes to then further support their point of you don't even know what it is you're eating if you're not buying it from a fisherman or you're not buying Georgia seafood or, or you know, whatever that is. Um, but not um, the particular uh, project that you bring up, I'm not familiar with. So I would like, I would like to look at that more closely. Were they doing DNA analysis on like Southern caught or U.S. caught seafood, or was it just, you know, sort of the sushi bar analysis situation? No, I, uh, in a nutshell, uh, they went out, they purchased uh, the, the several studies I'm aware of, they purchased uh, what was supposed to be red snapper, and they also purchased what were supposed to be locally caught shrimp. And these studies were done, I think the shrimp one was done in North Carolina. The red snapper one was done across the Southeast, if I'm remembering. Chip may help me remember here because it's been a while since I looked at these papers, but I, I can send them to you. And so once they made these purchases, then they took them back to the lab and they ran the DNA analysis on them to determine whether they were in fact, you know, a species of Southeastern Panaid shrimp or some other species, and then also whether or not it was red snapper. And in both cases, they found a high percentage of, you know, I'm hesitant to call it fraud because you never know um, whether or not the individual who purchased the product for resale was aware that it was something other than what they were selling it as. But in any case, uh, a good many of the shrimp were Pacific white-legged shrimp and a lot of the fish was some other species than red snapper. That's fascinating. I would love to read those if you wouldn't mind sending them or if I could get them from Chip, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, sure there's not. definitely not an awareness of that that I've I have heard raised at all. You know, aside from the, the average, you know, if you think you're eating grouper, you're probably not eating grouper sort of comments um, about yeah, I, eating restaurants. I, th I think I shared those with Chip. If not, I'll be happy to share them with both of you. Thank you so much. That's fascinating and depressing all at the same time, right? Yeah, and fortunately, Wilson, my, my memory is uh, is pretty cloudy on those. I, I know I read them and I remember some of those findings, but I think there might be others on the call today that, that might actually have more information on this. So if, if anybody on the, the call or the, the webinar has any information, um, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and I'll meet you. Oh, Chip, I'll jump in there one more. One more of them, Jennifer, was a uh, a, a North Carolina case where uh, they were, and this came out in the in a Department of Justice memorandum about the case, where they um, indicted and subsequently convicted, I believe, uh, uh, an entity who was importing uh, crab meat from Southeast Asia and then relabeling it as North Carolina caught blue crab. I do you remember that? Was that through Sea to Table? I'm sorry, say that again. I, I do remember that case. And was that part of the Sea to Table organization that was really popular about five, six years ago? 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I do remember that one. That's fascinating. But, you know, this is not something that comes up necessarily on the ground in these communities any more than just a general frustration with the state of seafood purchasing in the country kind of statement. All right, any other questions? If not, I have a, a short announcement after this. All right, I'm not seeing any hands go up. So based on uh, some requests in the past, um, we have added a feature on our website. It's under meetings. And if you just click on meetings and you go down to other meetings, you will now see a tab under there for the seminar series. And I'll be adding this uh, presentation uh, soon, but you can see all of our past seminar series as well. And so if you missed any of the, the talks in the past, you can go back and listen to them. Um, and this one should be up in the next few days. Uh, so if you missed anything today, you can, you can look it up or uh, you can watch it again. And then you can also find an uh, email address uh, for Dr. Tooth. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for your time today, Jennifer, and everybody else that came to listen. Uh, it was very informative, and we really appreciate those thoughtful answers. Thank you Take so care. much for your time, and I appreciate all of the, the great questions. Thanks, y'all. Right. Take care.